morning, guys. Great to see you. How's your school year? Good. Are you ready for a trip to the North Dakota Badlands? Yeah. I can't wait to get going, Mrs. Nelson. We've driven through the Badlands on our way to Montana several times, but we've never really gotten the chance to stop and check it out. Is it a long drive? Well, that's a good question. The Badlands are in the far southwestern corner of the state. They're found on both sides of the Little Missouri River from South Dakota all the way up to Lake Sakakawea. It's a vast landscape covering about 4% in North Dakota, and it's home to many unique plants and animals. Do you have your permission slips? Yep. Yeah. It's time to head out, and we've got a long ways to go. Well, here we are in the Little Missouri Badlands. What do you think? Wow, is this ever a neat place. It's even better than the pictures I've seen. Do you know who owns this land? Well, actually, Jess, you and everyone in this group share ownership of part of the land. Remember the map we looked at back in class with the different colored squares? The pink squares were the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. That's where we are now. Are all the Badlands a national park? No, Jess, all around the park, the Badlands are a mixture of private and public land. The colored squares are the public land managed by the state or federal government, and the white squares were the private land. We're standing on 1.2 million acres of public land. 1.2 million acres? That's huge. That is huge, Bill. Think back about when you studied the United States. The state of Delaware is about the size as the public land in the Badlands. Ms. Nelson, what's all this public land used for? Well, that's a good question. The national park land is set aside for wildlife, for people to enjoy wildlife, and the nature, but that's not all. The rest of the public land in the Badlands has a variety of uses. Things like cattle ranching, hunting, oil development, hiking, and bird watching. We call it multiple use land. It's a term that means these lands are managed for all citizens of North Dakota, and actually all citizens of the United States. I heard Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, came to the North Dakota Badlands to enjoy the wide open spaces. Theodore Roosevelt came to North Dakota to escape the stress of big city living and politics in the late 1800s. His wife and mother had recently passed away, and the Badlands of Dakota Territory was the perfect place to heal his sorrow and relax in an environment with freedom and endless beauty. He spent much of his time hunting and cattle ranching near Medora. The years spent in this region helped shape his view of wildlife and conservation and led to many wild areas being preserved for future generations. So Theodore Roosevelt helped establish this national park? Well, President Roosevelt died many years before this park was established, but his time in North Dakota helped him realize the importance of everyone being able to enjoy land like this. He also realized that the balance between the uses of the land was the key. If too much of one use occurred, then the other suffered. He also learned that it took large amounts of undisturbed habitat to sustain healthy wildlife populations. Mrs. Nelson, why is this area called the Badlands? Well, here in North Dakota, over 200 years ago, French trappers pursued fur-bearing animals like the beaver. They called this area Badland to travel across. So now we just call it the Badlands. Why is it so rough compared to other parts of the state? Wind and water cut and shaped this area through the process of erosion. It's been occurring for thousands of years. The Little Missouri River was a large factor in forming the landscape. Other parts of North Dakota were not formed by wind and water erosion. Remember those large sheets of ice that covered the northern and eastern part of the state? Those glaciers created the gently rolling hills, prairies, and wetlands. Is everybody ready to go explore more of North Dakota's badlands? Yeah. yeah. Let's go.
Hey guys, come here. There sure are a lot of cactus around here, but it doesn't look like a desert. Is it dry here? Don't you remember? We learned in North Dakota studies that Eastern North Dakota gets about six more inches of rain than Western North Dakota per year. That's right, Bill. And cactus are perfectly adapted since they're able to store water above ground. Almost all these plants out here have adapted to the limited rainfall. Those light green plants out there, that's sagebrush. They have a large root that stores energy and water during times of limited rainfall. Do animals use a sagebrush? Sage grouse wouldn't be here without the sagebrush. They depend on it for both food and water. The sagebrush lizard and the sagebrush vole also call this habitat their home. So how does the sagebrush grow so large with so little rainfall? That's a good question, Kayla. Many plants in the Badlands grow slowly because there's less rainfall. It takes a long time for them to grow to a large size. And when the vegetation gets damaged out here, it also takes a long time for it to grow back. Is that why we haven't seen very many farm fields? Well, that's part of it. But another reason is the soil. Out here, the soil, it's not dark and fertile like it is in the eastern part of the state. It contains more clay and sand, which isn't as good for growing crops like corn and sunflowers. It looks like you can still grow grass. That's right. Let's take a look at some of the prairie grasses. The Badlands is part of a habitat called the shortgrass prairie. Like other drought-tolerant plants, these grasses have adapted to dry conditions. They have deep root systems that allow the plant to go dormant during times with little rainfall. The Badlands are a more arid or dry climate than other parts of North Dakota. The plants that live here have evolved to survive with little rainfall. Some wildflowers can remain dormant for years. Then, when a wet spring arrives with thunder showers and plenty of rain, the prairie that was once brown and appeared lifeless can erupt into a landscape of color and beauty. Miss Nelson, are the prairie grasses important to wildlife? Absolutely. The grass is very important to wildlife in the Badlands. Sharp-tailed grouse and other birds rely on a thick cover of grass for attracting mates, raising their offspring, and building their nests. The sharp-tailed grouse is native to the Badlands, which means it has lived here for thousands of years. Male grouse gather in the spring, usually on a sparsely vegetated area with good visibility, where they dance to attract females from mating. Female grouse that are successfully mated choose a nesting site. The best nesting sites are those that contain adequate amounts of grass to hide and protect the nest. Since some birds nest in thick grasses, I'd say that area over there wouldn't be a very good place for birds to nest. Well, that's probably true. But that area is actually another important habitat in the Badlands. It's a prairie dog town. Prairie dog towns are scattered across the Badlands. The town is actually an underground network of tunnels where prairie dogs live and raise their young. Prairie dogs keep the vegetation short by feeding on the grasses, which also allows them to see when a predator approaches. Golden eagles can often be seen flying above a town, while coyotes hunt them on the ground. Badgers also feed on prairie dogs and can pursue them underground. Pronghorns are often attracted to graze on new plants found on prairie dog towns in the spring. Burrowing owls use prairie dog burrows to live in and raise their young. I never knew that a prairie dog town could be so useful for all kinds of wildlife. There are a lot of things out here we wouldn't expect. Let's take a look at some of the other habitats of the Badlands before we head home. Can you smell the sage? Yeah. This place is pretty awesome. Remember yesterday when we learned that water and wind erosion formed the Badlands? Take a look at the lines in this sandstone. Those were formed by the water erosion. There sure are a lot of crevices and holes. I'm glad you pointed that out, Kayla. That's what makes these formations so beneficial to wildlife. Does anybody know what a wren is? I do. 
It's a bird that makes its home in a tree or a birdhouse. We have wrens at our house every year. Very good. Wrens are birds that nest in cavities, many times in dead or dying trees. A rock wren is a close relative. It nests in the cavities that are formed within the sandstone and rock of the Badlands. Rock outcroppings or sandstone formations in the Badlands are beautiful creations molded over thousands of years by wind and water erosion. In addition to rock wrens, bushy-tailed wood rats or pack rats, least chipmunks and short-horned lizards make these places their home. What about bighorn sheep? Don't they live in this type of outcropping? Well, sort of, but on a larger scale. Bighorn sheep are animals that have very specific habitat needs. They require steep and high terrain where they can escape predators and raise their young. Bighorn sheep are native to North Dakota. Because there was no management or regulation in the 1800s, they became extirpated, which means they no longer existed here, but they did survive in other places. In 1956, bighorns were reintroduced into North Dakota, and they now live in some of the roughest parts of the Badlands. This remote habitat is a place for them to raise their lambs and remain isolated from things like domestic sheep, which can spread disease to wild bighorns. What would a bighorn sheep need to escape from? Well, young bighorn sheep, or lambs, are very vulnerable to predators like coyotes and mountain lions. Mountain lions can even prey on adult sheep. Do we have to worry about mountain lions? We need to realize that there are mountain lions in North Dakota, especially in the Badlands. But they're very solitary animals, and the chance of ever seeing one is very slim. Look, Miss Nelson, I see some deer over on that hillside. Are there a lot of deer in the Badlands? Well, I'm glad you pointed that out. Those are mule deer. Both white-tailed deer and mule deer inhabit the Badlands. White-tails are found primarily along the rivers and creeks, while mule deer prefer the rougher and steeper canyon country. The mule deer is generally a bit bigger, darker in color, and has large ears and a light-colored rump with a short black-tipped tail. The mule deer tends to hop on all fours in a movement called stotting. What do mule deer eat out here in the Badlands? Well, mule deer eat a variety of things, including grasses, forbs, and woody vegetation. Browsing is the term used for when they eat the leaves and buds off plants like chokecherry and ash. Woody draws are important places in the Badlands where they can find this type of food. What do you mean, woody draw? Well, the woody draw is an area that contains trees or other brushy cover. Woody draws are a very important habitat within the dry hills, buttes, and short grass of the Badlands. Woody draws are typically found in low areas where more moisture is trapped throughout the year. Because there is more moisture, trees and shrubs have established themselves and created small woodlands. Do animals use these woody draws in the Badlands? like they use the woodlands in the other part of the state. Yeah, now you're catching on. Woody draws provide habitat for animals that otherwise would not be able to live in the Badlands. Woody draws are an oasis for wildlife. In the Badlands, they're made up of deciduous trees, primarily green ash, but also box elder and elm. They provide cover for many birds that build nests in trees, including the yellow warbler, black-headed grosbeak, lazuli bunting, American redstart, and downy woodpecker. Bushes like juneberry, American plum, currant, and chokecherry produce fruits used by birds and mammals for food. Elk, deer, and turkeys use woody draws to escape from summer heat and the harsh winds and snow of winter. What about all those trees on that hill that look like Christmas trees? Well, let's go over and check it out. Those are cedar trees. They're commonly found in the Badlands. They're a coniferous tree and keep their green color year round. They're different than the deciduous trees that grow in the woody draws. They require less water so they can grow almost anywhere, including dry side hills. The dirt where those cedar trees are growing looks orange. Right, Jake. It's a material called scoria. It was formed many years ago by underground coal veins burning volcanic ash and clay into this flaky colored rock. Many of the hills are now covered with scoria because the scoria actually prevented the soil from eroding. Well guys, it's about time to head for home. I hope you've learned a little something about the North Dakota Badlands. I sure did. This habitat is important to all these neat wildlife species. We need to tell more people about this place. You're right, Bill. The more people know about special places like this, the better they'll take care of them. Well, how about the hiking? It's sure a nice place to walk and look at plants and scenery. 
I'm going to talk to my mom about taking me back here to hunt mule deer when I'm old enough to get a youth deer license. Yeah, and I'm going to try a trip on the Little Missouri since my family loves to canoe. Those are all great ideas. I'm glad you enjoyed the field trip. We're very fortunate to have this great public resource we can all enjoy.